I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 minutes with women, non binary, and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women, non-binary and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in the tech industry by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DEIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge the gap between schools and workplaces by getting to the heart of my guests' personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash their full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voice of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians, raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture, to retain diverse talent, so we keep the workplace power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, tech queen, Yoti Sohala David, co-founder and CEO at Umbrella. Hi, Yoti. Hi, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm very happy to have you joining us from Norway today. How are you? I'm really good. I'm all kind of refreshed after taking a really beautiful long holiday break or summer break as you call it what about yourself same same and we have sunshine here in Stockholm so I can't complain at all now let us dive into your journey into STEM hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus questions I'm ready let's warm up with a few fun facts about you how would you describe your personality in three hashtags curiosity empathy and happiness How would you describe your life in three sentences? Joy, travel, adventure. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? Hip-hop, R&B, and probably um, they call Luffy beats on YouTube. Uh, I really like those just in the background when I'm trying to get some work done. What is your personal motto? Whatever you do, do with everything that you have. What is your favorite book? Live Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. What is your favorite podcast? Right now is one of the people that we actually work with, Mung Falls Microphone by Michelle Tinopinen. Mac or PC? Mac for sure. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. I'm a very curious poet person. And so back at university, I had a nickname and it was called 21 Question. What is your hidden talent? It has to be my accent, my Australian accent. People get very surprised when I open up my mouth, even though, you know, I'm Norwegian. People get really, really surprised every time. If you're going to write a book about your life, what would a title be? Journey of Happiness. Amazing. Now, let us think deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in this little suburb called Drammen in Norway. What was your dream job as a child? Lawyer. What was your favorite subject in school? Society and culture. What was your least favorite subject? Math. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? Oh my goodness. It has to be the modem at home in Drammen. Which were the three first technology galaxies you owned? It was my phone, Nokia 3310, my Mac, and iPod. Who was your female, non-binary, or transgender role model growing up, and why? Beyonce. She's just a super fierce person. She has done so much in her life, had so many battles and hurdles and challenges because of the way she looks. So I really love to see her as a role model. 
How do you think where you grew up in the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? I think the fact that I did a year as exchange when I was 16 in Australia, that created a path because of the family that I lived with who had Aboriginal heritage. So seeing the obstacles and barriers that they went through, it wanted me to create a society or be a part of a society where I could build people where they felt a sense of belonging, but also be a part of, I guess, changing the society and how we look at people with different backgrounds and from a diversity lens. Very powerful. Now, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So you're deep. I want to know the choices behind your career path. Where and what did you study at university? I can really resonate with the quote number two. So I studied at Macquarie University in Sydney. I did education and also coaching, became a teacher. And I think that career path gave me the tools to understand how to connect with people. And I think that's where also my curiosity comes from. Who and what influenced you to get into your chosen field? I think it was myself, to be honest. I started with taking electives in anthropology. I was doing development studies where the focus is helping and supporting and working with NGOs. And then when I decided to take electives in anthropology and really focusing on the humans and how they are as people, but also how they take care of the society, it gave me the right tools and curiosity to understand, you know, how can I also be a part of building a, a more powerful society and also understand how to connect with other people that are different to myself. What professional roles have you had before that led you to start your own company? So I was working as a teacher and after that I started working as a project manager in a startup company in Oslo. And the reason I built my company was because of the challenge and obstacles that I saw my husband was going through when moving from Australia. So I had no intentions of becoming an entrepreneur. It kind of just landed in my feet. I saw a problem and I wanted to be a part of a solution. And what does Umbrella do? What don't we do? We like to say we're sort of an intersect between diversity and innovation. So our focus is to bridge a gap between skilled migrants and Norwegian companies. We want to support them. We want to get them into the job market. And in addition, we also facilitate workshops and leadership program focusing on diversity and inclusion as a lens. I like to call the Jedi mindset. What is your title and what is your main responsibilities? So my title is COO. I'm very sort of operational focused. And um, some of my responsibilities is recruitment, coach, some of our incredible talent sitting in our database. But I also facilitate workshops, everything from unconscious biases, inclusive recruitment processes, onboarding and offboarding to sort of just help companies to understand how to take care of the people that are in your company, but also how to onboard new people. What does a typical workday look like for you? Checking my emails. If I don't have any workshops on, I uh, go through my LinkedIn. I have a couple of messages there. It could be anyone from a company to candidates. I send proposals throughout the day. Uh, sometimes I do a workshop or a seminar or a speech or a live webinar. So it varies from, from day to day. I love the quote, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. So you are this. What do you love about your role? The impact that I create on people, the fact that I'm the person, there's no one in between us, there's no bureaucracy. I don't have to ask someone for advice or questions. I do it myself and I get the direct feedback from people when I've done something. So having that really impact on either its company, individual, a candidate, I, I really enjoy and thrive on that. What is then the best experience you've had in your role so far? Any examples? When I recruit people into organizations, uh, particularly when we have so many incredible talent who are overqualified in Norway, I think we're quite a homogeneous society, I would say. I think Nordic in general, and we don't know how to take care of them when they relocate to Norway. So being able to coach the person and get them into their recruitment, and when you get the hire, that is for me success. And every time I do it, I get goosebumps. And hearing from a candid perspective that, you know, you changed my life, that is something that it's unimaginable. And what is then the biggest challenge you've encountered so far and how did you tackle it? 
the fact that people here don't understand, you know, what they are lacking and what incredible, you know, baggage or luggage of competency people come with here. I think we're so used to what's similar. We don't like what's different. We're quite afraid from it. So I like to challenge that. But I think the obstacle sometimes here is that it backfires. Sometimes I feel the society isn't ready for it, but I also need to understand that I have to be very diplomatic on how I communicate that. So finding that balance, I find quite difficult sometimes. And what do you wish everybody understood about your role? That I wear five different hats. I can do anything. You know, uh, when people apply for jobs, they put you in a box. I really hate that. Uh, hate is a big word, but I've seen it so many times through recruitment. Um, I think there's so many transferable skills. You know, what you see on that piece of paper is not what is the total of the person. You need to get to know them. You need to understand them. You need to look at other skills outside of education and professional experience. You know, the fact that you've been on maternity leave for a year, you are so operational as you can be. You can multitask. Like, why don't we look at those skills? So I think the way we recruit today is very old fashioned and we need to change and disrupt that. What is the one common myth about your professional field that you want to disapprove? Oh, yeah, there's so many. I think don't hire d consultants as a tick of the box. There is a wave going on all around the world now that anyone can become a d consultant. I think that's rubbish. I think you need that competency and understanding of how to take care of those people, either if it's doing through certificates or your lifelong experiences. But I really believe that you need to have that wealth of knowledge before you take that leap or step. What do you love about working in the tech industry? Oh, so many things. Innovation. I think there are so many incredible things coming out out of technology, you know, things that I would never assume that could happen. So I love that, you know, it's fast paced, there's new things happening all the time. Of course, I would love more diversity in that space as well, because I think there would be more innovation. But I just love the, the fast pace of the environment. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone to greatness. Suhati, what have by far been your biggest achievement in your career? Starting my own business. I never thought that I would be here today. And those doors that have also opened up for me because of the incredible allies that I had. I've been very privileged. The fact that, you know, last week we started our first cohort for Borders, where we are developing a course on skilling women to get on board in Norway. I would have never imagined that I could do that. And I'm doing that today. So I think building my own company, building my own path, that's been incredible. What would you say then is the biggest factor that has helped you become successful in your success habits? I think just surrounding myself with good people who are supporting you. And I'm so, so, so lucky that I have a husband who is my champion and has always given me space to do whatever I want, has always been the supporter for me, even though when the finances doesn't pull through, he's been the one who's been supporting me. Without him, I wouldn't be here today. So beautiful. How do you measure your own performance at work? That's a big question on how performance is also measured. But there's only, you know, two of us, but we also an external consultant. So we have our general meetings where we connect and we talk about, you know, where things that are working, some things that are not working, how can we get better? But of course, bigger you get, you need more metrics in place. With success come failures. What is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? I think trust. I would say I have a lot of empathy for people, but I've also learned that um, sometimes you can judge wrong of who the person is. So I think learning from it, growing from it and understanding that, you know, people are different and that's okay. But it's also important to understand, you know, when to take a step back as well. What would you say is inspiring and motivate you the most in your role and career right now? Just meeting incredible people. I feel like I'm learning every day because I'm creating new content. I'm creating new material. I'm meeting these badass women in, in Bordevers and they have this wealth of knowledge. I see that as an opportunity to increase my growth mindset. So I'm really grateful that I'm always learning and educating because I'm also working as an external consultant. Let us now jump into the influence of mentors, role models, champions, and sponsors. Role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, champion can stand up and advocate for us and open up the world of possibilities. Sponsors match emerging talent with leaders and influential employees who can help us move ahead in our careers. Yoti, do you have a mentor, champion, or a sponsor today? 
I think both my co-founder and the external consultant, Michelle, that we're currently working with, she has 20 plus years of experience from corporation and I'm learning so much from her because of the use of experience she has. But she's also learning so much from me. And Marin, who is also my co-founder, she has, you know, political background. She was also my mentor when I built my first company. So those two and of course, many, many more. And who is the female non-binary or transgender role model you look up to in your field? In my field, it has to be Purnima Luthera and also Brandy Brown. History shows that it has been more common for men having mentors, champions, and sponsors in business than women. So you have to, how important do you think is to have a mentor, champion, or sponsor during one's career? I think it's so important. And the reason I say that, it goes back to what do you see in front of you? So if I don't see myself in social media, in you know, leadership positions or other avenues, I think it's less likely for me to actually thrive for something bigger and greater good. And that's why I always talk about leadership positions or being on board. I don't see myself. I don't feel like we mirror the society today. So it's more likely for me to not aim that high. And looking at my nieces, I'm always thinking, you know, I need to create a society when they see themselves and when they do, they will also thrive for those successes. Let's move on to leadership. Adina Friedman, president and CEO of Nasdaq said, I quote, empowering those around you to be heard and valued makes a difference between a leader who simply instructs and one who inspires. And Shirley Sandberg, ex-CEO of Facebook said, I quote, leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. What does leadership mean to you? Leadership means to have a growth mindset, to know when to say, I don't know. I think a lot of leaders today have this idea in their head that you need to know everything. But to be a leader who has empathy and allyship and understanding that it's okay not to know everything and supporting the people that are different to yourself. I think that's the core element of being an inclusive leader. Until you don't know what mistakes you're making, how are you going to open up for other people? What do you consider a good versus a bad leader? I would say good leader is someone that can be open to the mistakes that they make and can own up to it. I think that makes you such a powerful leader and you hone on the respect from other people in your team. Failure as a leader is the one that don't see that. Failure as a leader is who sees challenges as an obstacle and doesn't see diversity as a growth opportunity, but they see that as a, a challenge because it's different to yourself. Who is your favorite female non-binary or transgender tech leader and why? I think right now, someone that I really look up to in the startup and scale-up ecosystem, someone that you actually had on your podcast as well, it's Sen Kalandova. What she's built and the work that she's doing in the field today, it's incredible. And she's such an incredible person as well outside of work. So I really look up to her. How would you describe yourself as a leader? Oh, yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, from what other people have said and being in a small company and organization, I, I would say I've been seen as a very, a person that has a lot of empathy. I listen, I give people the space to be heard and I take things in and I and try and do better. That's all I can do. So I would say I'm probably leaning more towards uh, a leader has or empathetic leader. And as a leader, what values are most important to you? I think going back to what I said earlier, you know, have a lot of empathy for people and always being open to new challenges. I think every day is a learning opportunity. I love, you know, how people say you hire someone that's better than yourself so you can learn from them. I think I want to be that kind of leader. I, I want to, you know, not see that as a challenge, but I want to see that as an opportunity on how I can actually grow, how the other people in the company can also grow. What leadership lessons have you learned that have formed you into the leader you are today? You don't have the answer to all the questions. You might have an answer to one, but it's okay to say that you don't know. I think growing up, particularly from an Indian culture, you were supposed to know everything. If not, you would, you know, look things up. I think what I've learned from, you know, living in Norway and from other leaders as well is that it's okay to say, you know, I don't know or I made a mistake. I'll do better next time. I think that's very powerful. What are your three strengths and three weaknesses? Uh, three strengths, I would say I have a lot of courage. I think my curiosity has also given me the opportunities where I am today. And I'm quite resilient. And my weaknesses, I like to do things quick. Sometimes it can backfire. It's really hard for me to stop. I always go over to the next project whenever I have even haven't finalized the first project because I'm always eager to, you know, move to the next steps. 
I don't know if this is a weakness, but I love moving from country to country. You know, after living in Norway for a couple of years, I kind of asked the question from my husband, can we move back to Australia now? So I can't sit still. And so we're always moving. And it can also be a bad thing because I have parents here. So uh, yeah. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today and your expertise area, workplace culture, unlocking the power of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Yoti, what does DEIB mean to you personally? Yeah, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I like to call it Jedi mindset, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. If I'm going to put it in one sentence, it means belonging. It means utilizing the whole society, taking care of the whole society, and making sure that everyone feels a sense of belonging. And that kind of links with the work that I'm doing through my company. Today, I feel there are untapped resources, untapped talent that has not been able to showcase their professionalism and their competency because we have structural racism. We have your know, privilege in our society today. And I think when you're able to build a Jedi mindset in companies today and really understand like how to actually use those different competency and different diversity dimensions of people, when you create that sense of belonging, I think we can come really far. What do you consider being three to five signs of good company culture if you were to join a company? I always look at leadership first. You know, what does a leadership look like? Does it mirror the person I am? What kind of programs and initiatives do they have around Jedi or diversity and inclusion? I think what's also really important for me is where in the world are they also based? Yeah, and I think the last thing is the recruitment processes. Like I seeing who's involved in the recruitment policies and initiatives when you are bringing on people with diverse talent. Uh, I think that's also really important for me. And as a woman, what has been the most significant barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? Yeah, good question. Um, because I also have an ethnic minority, my life has been a challenge on many levels. Of course, I have a lot of privileges as well, but I also think compared to others, when it comes to, you know, applying for things or pitching or connecting with the companies or trying to sell something, I know always that, you know, there is a glass ceiling. There is always a barrier for me to get an acceptance. So I always try to put myself in other allies who can open up doors for me. So I know it's a barrier, but I do not feel sorry for myself. Instead of, you know, sobbing about it, I always try and sort of push even further. And I think when you do that, you get really far, but I also know it's not easy and it's not for everyone. Why do you think it's important for more women, non-binary and transgender to join the tech industry today? Visibility and also the products that we're creating are created for them, but they're not the one creating it at the moment. That's why we have so many challenges in, in tech solutions. You know, you read so many different case studies, driving the car or using the, what do you call it, the, the sounding system, I think it's called. When you're using that as well, you know, it's created by a very homogeneous group. So we need to be able to mirror the society. And at the moment, we're not doing that. It's a very boys club. And I think that needs to be changed. So to create a tech for society, you also need to be able to mirror. Do you and how do you speak with your colleagues about the EIB challenges, for example, salary gaps and promotions? Yes, we do all the time. I even coach my candidates on, you know, how to do salary negotiations and benchmarks. Because I think a lot of people are taken for granted here, particularly because, you know, when you move from abroad, you don't really know or have an understanding of the benchmarks. So we talk about it. And I think by talking about it, you're creating more awareness and then other people will also talk about it. So creating that openness and um, also pushing your colleagues, but also pushing, you know, my husband, his colleagues to share those conversations. It's going to open up for other people to also be more open, I guess. There are many public and internal discussions about the barriers women, non-binary and transgenders face from reaching higher position in the tech industry. How do you feel has affected and is affecting you? And what is your advice on how to best unblock these roadblocks? I think, you know, again, we have to look at who's at the top. So again, representation is everything. When you have a leadership who does not represent what we are representing today, that's the first roadblock. So getting them through the recruitment practices or getting them through the recruitment, it's more difficult. So representation is everything who's actually a part of it. So you can nudge the people to go, you know, is that actually what we're looking for? Are you going outside of the criteria that we're looking for? 
That's also why I believe in quotation. I know a lot of people don't. And to unblock them, it's, yeah, like I said, representation in the processes, but also creating KPI and metrics around, you know, we need X amount of people with this and this background, you know, X amount of women, X amount of people with non-binary. So when you have those set in place, then you actually are forced to do it because it's a part of the strategy, it's a part of the company's policy. But if you're just talking about it, that's not going to make a difference. So setting it in place and showing by actions that we really care about it, that's when you're going to be able to create those barriers. And today, tech companies spend a lot of marketing money to attract women, non-binary and transgenders. However, at the same time, they're finding it hard to retain them. Articles show that women are leaving the tech industry. So what is your best advice or strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages gender diversity and equity? That is so true. Like we noticed that there's a lot of fake employer branding out and going because, you know, it's a trend now. Same way talking about inclusion diversity is a trend to have DNI consultants. Everyone's doing it without really actually understanding like why and what competency that you need. I really believe in uh, mentorship, you know, um, having mentors in your company that can help you and support you and build other people that are coming into the organization. But I would also say that We are competing in a market today and often we see the younger generation, you know, some of the first questions when they go into an organization is, you know, what does the company look like today? Can you see me in the company or in the organization? What is the culture? You know, what's the health and safety or health and well-being in the organization? So if you don't have those structures in place, you're going to find it really difficult to get the right people. So mirroring the society, producing the closely recruitment processes, but also mentors. Having women uh, who's mentoring other women who's coming into tech who also understands them, I think that's also very powerful. And what would you say are the few challenges of implementing DIB culture in a workplace today? I think when uh, it's not done authentically, you know, you're doing it because it's, you know, forced and also getting the best talent, which is, of course, it, that's great. And that's what you need to do, but it's not done authentically. So you're just bringing someone in, you're doing it halfway. And the people that are also doing it, they're not even representing. So quite often it's homogeneous. And I think that's what is really frustrating for people like us. So when I go into big organizations, I don't see myself in the HR team or in the talent acquisition team or in the leadership team. And you are going to build policies and processes about us. In my head, that doesn't make any sense. So that's a red flag for me. So if you haven't done it authentically, I think that's your first mistake. Why and how do you think companies would benefit from having not just women non-binary and transgender leaders, but actually higher gender presentation at C-level and boardrooms with actual mandates? Well, that's again representation, right? You will see the, the type of recruitment you do. If you do get representation up in leadership positions, it will change. We're already seeing it in Norway. There was a report that came out a couple of months ago from PA Consulting, where it says in the 100 biggest organizations in Norway today, there's one person with ethnic diversity in a leadership position. It's gone down from 2019. It was three back then. So that shows that it's very homogeneous because people hire people just like themselves. So if we don't get representation further up, it will never change. So breaking those barriers is really, really important. So representation is everything. But to be able to do that, you need to bring in other people that also have you know, diversity of thought, but also diverse background. Otherwise, you were never able to do it because you have never been in that position before. You are not the person that you are trying to hire into a leadership position. And how much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding the IAB since you joined? What? You know, being in the startup and scale-up ecosystem, I see new transformations every single day. Even just, let's look at recruitment processes. There's new companies coming out with, you know, new integrations, new tools. And I think that's great because it's based on what's been going on for the last couple of years. So every couple of years, there's a new platform, there's a new tool, there's a new software and so on. So I would say it's constantly changing and it's becoming more and more rapid. Looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? 
probably um, communicate it a bit more clear and being more open about it. Um, I feel older that I've gotten and also working in this space, I have also empowered myself. I have the right vocabulary to communicate. I would say when I was younger, I didn't even know that I was actually going through some discrimination myself. But now I'm sort of plugging it and understanding it. So um, I wish I just had the right wording to communicate. And looking forward, what will you do as a leader beyond the amazing job you're doing right now with the umbrella to improve the bias for the next generation of women, non-binary and transgenders? I think keep putting the word out. You know, I often talk about learning and development and education and learning is the key. To empower yourself, you need to constantly learn and develop. And I think that's what I've been doing and that's what I'll continue to preach to the younger generation, to my nieces, to my family and have conversations openly. You know, I believe in the power of LinkedIn. There are so many incredible stories to share. There are so many incredible conversations to have. Just continue to share that knowledge and expand on it is very powerful. Let's move on to another hot topic in business today, which is work-life balance and mental health. Yoti, you have without a doubt a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a tricky one. Um, that's actually been quite hard, to be honest. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I think we are so lucky in the Nordics that we have the summer holidays where you could completely disconnect, knowing that you won't get a lot of emails during July because everyone else disconnects and taking five weeks off. I think that has given me so much support. Before the summer holidays, it was really bad, but after the summer holidays, I reflected. So I make sure now that, you know, after five o'clock, I don't look at my computer. I focus on, you know, my second half because it's also important to take care of the ones around you. It's not just all about you. And I don't spend the weekends, most weekends now, if it's not urgent, to work before I go sit in front of my computer. Even though I didn't have to, it was just a habit. So I force myself to do it. And I also read in the evenings now. Before I used to go on LinkedIn or, you know, watch a TV series just to kind of unplug myself. But now I started reading stories and listening to podcasts as well. Have you ever experienced burnout? I think I have without knowing it. I think it was before the summer holidays. I was very, very exhausted. I had no energy, but I don't think I had the right terminology for it. So luckily for me, the holidays came right after. So I was quite fortunate. So I, I, I'm a bit unsure, actually. I think I've been very exhausted, but if that was a bird out, I'm not sure. What is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in a new now? A part of Umbrella, we talked about, you know, having full work days. I think after the pandemic, we also learned that there is a possibility. Uh, we also seen that research been done in the UK, but also in Australia. And the result from the one in the UK was that I guess you effectivize how fast you work in the four days. And usually the last day is more of a chill day. But I think creating a work-life balance on minimizing, you know, work days so from five to four days. But also just making sure that anything that comes after five or four o'clock, you don't have to do it. But I think a lot of people do it because it's a habit. And that's what we also need to change. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? I'm just excited about work, I guess. I just, uh, I'm excited about a new project. I'm excited about, you know, creating a new relationship. I'm excited about connecting with a new company. I'm excited about learning about new things or there might be an opportunity that comes up that I wasn't aware of or a new mail that came in my inbox about you know, an exciting new project. Yeah, so I, I would say work is such a big part of my life, but that's what excites me the most. Now, let's wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Jody, what is the best piece of advice you've been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? Someone said to me that your background and the fact that you have, you know, ethnic minority, that's your power. It would be something else if you want it to be. You can use it as, you know, an obstacle if you want it to be, but you're the one who set the, set the grounds. And I think that is on many levels very powerful because instead of thinking that the way I look is an obstacle, I see that as a tool to sort of create change for other people as well. And I keep pushing and thriving for that, even though it's really difficult. But I think growing as a person and using my diversity as a tool to empower other people has created a lot of success for me. 
And then what is the worst advice you've ever been given and how did you tackle it? That things are going to be difficult for me. The way I look, it's going to be challenging, but I've never seen it like that. I think whenever a challenge comes to me, I just want to show the opposite. I want to show that I can actually do it. I'm capable. And it's also ingrained, I would say, in my Indian culture. We work so hard. I would say anyone with ethnic diversity, we work so damn hard. We have people, we have family that moved to a new country. They didn't know the language. They didn't have the right tools. They didn't have a family. They worked their butt off. So you can throw anything at us and we'll just do it. We'll just thrive. So I think that's kind of the mantra that I have that stems from my parents and how I sort of move away from it when people say it's going to be more difficult for you. I guess I just listen to my inner voice. Where I am today, I've come that far because of who I am. And I need to remember that. I need to keep saying that to myself. So as long as I'm doing that and I'm true to myself, I know that I am going to be successful in whatever I do. Very powerful. Is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? Well, I guess this is more of um, on the corporate side. I wish I had more understanding of how the corporate world works, the jargon, because I feel I'm humble. I give everything in what I do and I'm very talkative and I'm very eager. And sometimes that can also backfire in bigger corporations or bigger organizations. I'm not used to that. So I wish I kind of had that jargon and understanding before I moved into building up my own company. If you had the ability to go back in time to when you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? Any obstacle is an opportunity. What advice would you give to young girls, women, non-binary and transgenders who want and trying to break into STEM fields today, especially watch to become next generation leaders? I would just say keep pushing. Your world is your oyster. People can say whatever they want, but as long as you surround yourself with other incredible people that empower you, you will get really, really far. Last but not least, what is next for you in your role and career in tech? What are your career aspirations? So many. You know, I could write a book about this. I have actually thought about it. Um, I think the next thing for me would be continue the work that we're doing, of course. I would love to have more cohorts to go through our board course or workshops. I would love to get women on boards after the courses as well. I would love to write a book about being an ally and also being an empathetic leader. I want to continue to co-create you know, material and content for bigger corporations and organizations to help them understand you know, how you can attract but also retain talent and what are some of the tools that you need to also empower them to see you know, the potential that you're actually losing out on and uh, how you can use the whole society because right now it's fairly homogeneous. So I want to continue to empower leaders, but I also want to continue to empower candidates and uh, organizations. Amazing, Yori. I'm looking forward to follow your journey and to see all of these goals come true. Thank you very much for being a guest on the Queens of Tech podcast. Sharing your journey will without a doubt inspire change and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, non-binary and transgender leaders in tech. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemoradi.com. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit Queens of